Hi, so we're just going to look at some basic digital workflow using View NX, Nikon's View NX. Um, I mainly use this obviously for just processing my Nikon RAW files. Um, I was using Capture NX to begin with, but after upgrading to the D700 a while back and the files wouldn't open in the version I had, I stuck with View NX, which has recently been updated to version 2 point something, 2.12 maybe. Um, it's pretty good. Um, I've got this um, sitting on a two monitor layout. So I have my thumbnails and the adjustments window here. Um, and although this right hand monitor is not color calibrated, um, it's useful obviously just for splitting up my workspace into thumbnails and a full size preview. So I, on the left here you see a folder um, folder window which there's various things you can have in this this window here but the folder window is all I need it just allows me to navigate between folders so I can collapse that and I've got all my thumbnails on the screen so you'll see there's a few here with stars this is usually the first process I'll go through when I when I start um, looking through a folder of files to boil down to a selection for either a client or to go on my blog um, you, in fact you'll see JPEG and an F here that's mainly because um, at the moment I've actually already batch converted a bunch to JPEG but um, if we look at one of these NEFs we have an adjustment window here which allows us to um, do various sort of small scale things with the with the picture what I'm generally looking at here are white balance corrections so there's various choices you can you can run through to, to change the white balance from something other than the one you recorded in camera. Typically I would use the grey point, so we'd need to pick a colour image for that. So let's find one here, um, which hasn't been modified. Oh, we'll use this one. Okay, let's choose this one here. This was a tricky one, obviously, because it, it was recorded, it's quite a long exposure at night, so you get all kinds of strange colour casts going on with the, um, with the picture. Um, I could actually reset this to to what it was like straight out of the camera. Let's just see if I can do that. Uh, actually, not sure if I can do it after actually applying an edit. Maybe I can't. Um, but what we can do here, if we pick up the use grey point choice on the white balance adjustment and click start, we then get a, a sort of eyedropper tool. And generally, you'll want to click on a white or grey area. We'll choose this mid grey here and it's, the first adjustment takes a little while for the... there we go. Okay, so it's it's gone back to something akin to what it was like when it was out of the camera actually. This one, the white balance was quite tricky on that, to actually change it manually. That's closer to what we had on the screen just now. You can finish it to stop it. I want to try and try and get this to be just a little better. I'm going to pick it up off what this sign here, which I knew to be grey. Oh, that's very blue. Okay, let's try it off this window frame. Sometimes with these, that's better. With the things shot at night where you've got lots of complicated light sources, there was fluorescence and sodium light here, it, the, the balance can be quite difficult to, to get. So we'll click finish and that's done. Some of the other things I use more, more than others are this shadow protection slider, which will put detail into the shadow areas. As you can see, that's that's bringing up quite a bit of detail in the shadows. You want to be careful using this too much because it can begin to make the shadows quite blocky, noisy. The shadows typically have noise and the camera's not recording so much information there so um, quite often what I'll do with my RAW files is try and overexpose them and then pull down the highlights and we could try that on some of the highlights in the background here. It's not bringing too much back in this case. We can try another picture to, to get a better idea of what that tool is doing. But generally these are the kind of changes I'm making. Nothing too large scale because basically what I want to do is just prep the file to, to be the best raw material to take into Photoshop and edit properly afterwards. Um, so if we just look at the rating system on these files for a while, what I would tend to do is I tend to give the ones I want to convert or give to a client a five star rating. So you just click on the file and down the bottom here um, you can you can give it a rating. 
five stars or no stars is what I prefer to do. I can then um, sort and view all the files by rating only. Once I've done that, what I'll probably then do to get maybe a smaller selection of files, um, let's actually sort those now. So we'll sort them by rating, ascending, and it should put all our five star files. Okay, let's do it descending. It's a little counterintuitive. Okay, we've got all our five star files here now. What I'd probably then do is go through, and the ones I really wanted to convert, um, I'd give a number rating to as well. So then I can view all the ratings with a label um, of one, and that puts them all to the top. Um, in terms of batch converting, um, this convert files dialog um, offers you choices of TIFF and JPEG. Um, quite often I'm using this to, to do maybe a batch of TIFFs then to take into Photoshop or a batch of JPEGs to, to just put straight out of the camera up onto my blog. So you can choose an image size. Um, then you can either choose to put them in a specified folder or drop them in the same folder as the original files. And you can change the file names. So there's various choices on this front with the original name plus in this case a suffix of blog. So I know what they are when I look in the folder and I can then just upload them all straight away to the website. That's kind of it. Um, there's a few little foibles with this program, probably not least of which is back in that convert files. If you want, if you don't want to change the image size, then you've got to make sure that the full-sized image size, which you'll see up here, the original image size, is, is in that box, and then uncheck it. For some strange reason, this program even if you uncheck the box and it has a value other than the original image size in there, it will resize them. It's just a peculiarity of the program, unfortunately, so just remember to do that. Um, other than that, it's it's all pretty good. Very basic program, but it gives you all the choices you, um, you need, uh, all the tools you need to choose pictures you want to then convert, so rating. Um, you can add tags and keywords, but generally with my file naming structure, I can I can find something very quickly if somebody emails me and after having found a picture on the web um, the, the, the file I put on the web will be something like this one here you see so it has the original file name in it, numbering um, and then I will just search my, my computer for that. I don't tend to add lots of tags and keywords in, in a program like this. Um, I may do that if I'm sending files to a stock library I'll put them in, in Photoshop um, but not here generally. Um, Photoshop has the ability to to keep its data in the images in IPTC format, which is um, cross-platform compatible, so it's easier to do than any tagging in Photoshop as and when I edit the images for final use. Um, that's it. Um, the, other, the other useful thing, I guess, here is this picture control utility. So you can see here I've actually um, shot the picture originally in a, in a high-contrast monochrome picture control which I made myself. Um, but what you can do is if you click this launch utility it will boot up Nikon's picture control utility and allow you to change the image um, and it'll bring up the original so it's the original in color um, and it's given us choices to go through we can put it into one or other of the established picture controls I've got loaded into the computer which are also loaded into my, my camera um, or what I can do, I could perhaps begin with one um, and then I can actually mess around with the picture um, if I, where is it, use custom curve so I can I can mess with the picture using the curve so we've made a kind of high key slightly contrasty um, picture there we go now what I can do is actually I could I could save this so I can actually make a new custom picture control. Maybe we can just call this color high key one. Save it. Now I can actually if I click the export button it will give me a dialog. Okay, it's come there's no card in this slot. But if, if I um, had a memory card in my card reader and clicked export it would allow me to save that picture control to a memory card which I can then put back into the camera. So this is a very useful piece of um, the software where you can start to create 
picture controls which you can then go out and shoot in. That's really about it for the um, View NX. I'll be also doing a piece like this on Capture One which is what I use mainly to edit the files from the digital medium format camera um, but I also use for one or two other things as well because it does them better than this um, but for all the Nikon files basically looking at them in the Nikon software is the only way you're going to be able to see the original colors you shot them in um, because Adobe Camera Raw and other raw processors tend to interpret Nikon's algorithm rather differently to how Nikon in interprets it itself um, or you can also switch it between the picture controls that you you have available in the computer or in the camera. That's it. Brief uh, overview of Nikon View NX.